Masada is a fortress that is located at the southern eastern end of the Judean wilderness, about 1,340 feet above the Dead Sea level, which is located east and right across from it lies the mountains of Edom. Well, from the western side, we can see the edge of the Negev toward the north, and toward the south, we can see the Judean wilderness. It's a rock about two-thirds of a mile long and a third of a mile wide. Josephus' account of the mass suicide at Metzada is so compelling that after Israel was established in 1948, the slogan, Matsada shall not fall again, became symbolic of the modern state. Archaeological digs commenced by the Germans in the 1930s for a short season of two weeks, digging the storage rooms complex toward the south end of the fortress. While the main excavations were done by Yigal Yadin, two seasons of intensive excavations between the years 1963 and 1965. Yigal Yadin said, Matsada represents for all of us in Israel and for many elsewhere, archaeologists and laymen, a symbol of courage, a monument to our great national figures, heroes who chose death over life of physical and moral serfdom. Well, we have to remember that he was also a general in the Israeli army, a Zionist and politician. And in the aftermath of the Holocaust, the Jewish people needed a heroic act to unite and give hope. That's why the way we look at the excavations results of the 1960s and that of today is a bit different. Not wishing to use the word a heroic act that became a myth. Matsada is a story that can be explored from various angles. Our team is here to tell you that story. Greatness and madness of a king. Herod the Great. Brutality and courage of the rebels. Eleazar ben Yair. Rome, the superpower that never left a job unfinished. General Flavius Silva, we invite you to the mountain. In this very same room, Volunteers digging have found a minted coin, written on it, for the liberation of Zion, third year of the revolt. Egal Yadin held it at hand and went through his imagination. Seeing Elazar ben Yair standing here, watching the Romans building their siege wall and camps, Elazar has a strange smile. As ironic, the situation is when Jews are using this fortress to defend themselves against Rome, when originally the fortress was built by Herod to mostly defend himself against the Jews. Herod the Great, wow, what a character. Let's see what he built and then I will tell you my story. King Herod the Great is known as the master builder with many amazing projects, such as Herodian, Caesarea Port, and the Temple of Jerusalem expansion, as well many other projects. But Masada stands amid all his projects for the remoteness of the fortress and the difficulties encountering engineers bringing all need supplies. The entire summit measuring three quarters of a mile around he enclosed it within a limestone double casement walls, 18 feet high with a 12 feet wide, 37 towers, each 75 feet high. From these towers, one could pass through a ring of chambers 
price round the inside of the wall. 30% of the plateau was of rich soil, more workable than other in the plain. King Herod reserved it for cultivation so that if ever there was a shortage of food from without, this should not affect those who had entrusted their safety to these ramparts. Quarries were dolomite rock stones were cut out to build the fortress. The empty pits were plastered to be used as water cisterns. Connected with water canals goes around all the mountain round, collecting every drop of rain that goes down at the top of Masada. King Herod, he constructed six villas for his guests and friends, where all the exterior walls were plastered. The inner walls was richly ornated, decorated with frescoes and stucco. The rooftops was made from wooden beams covered with mud. Fourteen storage rooms were found where food would have been stored at. Each room was two stories and no windows on east or western walls so that the sun rays won't get in damaging the food. Cyprusian important wine, amphoras and jars, and Sicilian pickled spice fish salsa were amid the many delicious stored food that the king used and his guests as it was discovered in archaeological digs. Typical Roman bathhouses consisting of cold room, dressing room, hot room, jacuzzi, and sauna. Colorful opus sectile tiles and frescoes. Furnace heating the water that leads the steam through underground hypercost system heating the floor. Hollowed clay pipes on walls that worked as a heat insulating system. Pockets of stones with water that will be poured on the floor. This water, it will evaporate and the evaporated water, it will touch the domed ceiling and the water, it will go down through this dome to the floor to be heated again, not to be dropped over the head of the people. A northern hanging palace, which is purely Roman architecture, embedded in the rock, hanging over three terraces over 30 meters high with a hidden stairway connecting the three levels. An upper terrace with a balcony and guard room, bedrooms, where clearly you can view and see Engedi 17 kilometers far with a great view overlooking the Maral bedland below that look like the surface of the moon with that reddish reflection 
of the mountains of Edom over the Dead Sea. A middle terrace with a circle, decorative reception hall, topped with a cone-shaped pillar, dome above two rooms at the back. A third lower terrace with a reception hall and lavishly decorated patio. What can I tell you about this king? He had a taste for luxury, where he built another south and western palace with a massive complex of mixed Roman and Hellenistic architecture, covering a space of one acre. Rooms surrounding a centralized court, which would have functioned as the royal court decorated with stucco and beautiful colorful mosaic that cover the reception hall and the grand bathhouse right next to it. Getting hot? Well, let's go to the next door swimming pool that Herod added to his palace. Herod was indeed a magnificent builder, but it's not his construction work that made Metsada famous. It's the events of the years 66 to 73 AD that have brought fame to this desert palace fort, and even listing it on the UNESCO list of world heritage was due to the Roman sage wall rather than Herod's work. 6 AD, after Archelaus lost his kingdom, Judea comes under direct Roman rule, and the Roman garrison would be stationed at Metsada, till the breakout of the Jewish revolt in the year 66 AD, when Jewish rebels took over the fortress, putting its garrison to the sword. Let's join our team for the rest of our story. Wow, what Herod built, that story of a luxury life, of a sort of a mad king, is a bit different than our dramatic events. Menachem the Galilean took over Masada in 66 AD, and when he was killed in Jerusalem, Eleazar ben Yair took over the command of Masada, and later on was joined by rebels and their families, who managed to escape Jerusalem destruction. He added a second wall to the defensive wall built by Herod. Stocked food at the storerooms, converted Herod's villas to accommodate the rebels and their families. An altered building like the bathhouse, adding mikveh for a body purification, and used the synagogue as a spiritual center. 72 AD, after the destruction of Jerusalem and the fall of the fortress Macarius, zealots were determined to continue the fight against the Romans. Their last stronghold is Masada, where we are. He stood watching the Romans building the siege wall and the camp. He could see from the top of the fortress General Flavius Silva, walking amid his soldier. September of the year 70 AD, Titus left Jerusalem in ruins, 
and the 10th Legion Fritenses was left in the country to keep order, but also to ensure that no more attempts of the insurrectionists are made to rise against Rome, with still three strongholds being held by the rebels, Herodion, Macerus, and Matsada. Lucilius Bassus, the Roman general, set out to subdue these last holdouts. The Herodian and Macerus were quickly taken, and only one left. It was Metzada, and this is where we are. Bassus died in Jerusalem in the year 72 AD, and Flavius Silva was assigned in his place. Romans never left a job unfinished. And now here we are at Metzada, with about 8,000 Roman soldiers, the legionaries of the 10th Legion Fritensis, and few extra auxiliaries. The logistics were complicated. Rebels on the top of the rock, with abundance of water and food supply left by Herod's infrastructure long time ago, while for the besiegers, they had a tougher, tougher times. Water and food had to be supplied by the ships across the Dead Sea and from other areas carried by slaves to the camps. Since the area lacks springs of water and any nearby farms. Let's see how the Romans built the siege engine, which is considered so unique. As we can see, it remains intact, as was built out of rocks, while in, other, in all other places around the empire, it was made of wood and mud bricks, which were fragile, and a lot of it was lost with time. Also to remember Masada's remote location, where no one came later to utilize the construction material. First, a siege wall. A circumvallation was built all around the fortress at 12 feet high and about 1,400 feet long, which completely encircled the base of the mountain, making it impossible for any of the rebels to escape or anyone to join them. Eight camps were built, labeled by archaeologists alphabetically from A through H, connected by the visible runner path. You know, no internet or phones 2,000 years ago. So they had a runner messenger delivering news and orders between the camps. Okay, so Camp F, where we are, is the largest and definitely was the headquarter of General De Silva. The camp had guard towers to make sure that no one scaled it, crossed by two paths and circular walls built with as a base for the leather-made tents. In the center stood the main tent of General Silva, and even a nearby triclinium was discovered where they would dine facing the fortress. The Romans sought to bring the siege to a swift resolution. And to accomplish this, they had to move their troops and siege machinery up the steep, rocky slopes of the mountain and break through Herod's fortifications wall at the top. There were two paths to reach the top of the Masada, the snake path on the east and another path on the west, today buried under the Roman ramp. Using these paths, would have required the soldiers to climb up in a single line while carrying their personal equipment as well as the battering ram, which had to be erected at the top to break through the Herodian casemate wall, while leaving the soldiers vulnerable to stones, boulders, and other projectiles thrown or fired by the defenders above. To solve this, Silva ordered his men to construct an assault ram of dirt and stones, which ascended to the summit from a low white hill called the Luc by Josephus, just where we are standing. Once completed, the ramp provided a gentle slope that the soldiers could ascend easily with several men across. At the top of the ramp, they erected a stone platform for the battering ram. They simply covered the ridge, paving it with wood and dirt.
Eleazar watched the Romans manipulating the 300 feet natural ridge on the western side, paving it and then filling it with dirt, yet not reaching the top. And then the battering ram tower appeared, pushing it up on the ramp. Now the Romans are facing the rebels face to face. The walls did not hold long, and even the wooden beams of Herod's rooftop buildings would not stand as the Romans set it on fire. Notice, this is the spot where Roman ventured through. The climax of our dramatic story might have taken place at this building, the synagogue. According to Josephus Flavius, Eleazar gathered the main rebels and he would address them, taunting them that death in an honorable way better than falling into the hands of the Romans. Eleazar's speech as recorded by Josephus Flavius. My loyal followers, Long ago, we resolved to serve neither the Romans nor anyone else, but only God, who alone is the true and righteous Lord of men. Now the time has come that bid us prove our determination by our deeds. In our case, it is evident that daybreak will end our resistance, but we are free to choose an honorable death with our beloved ones. This is our enemies cannot prevent. However, earnestly, they may pray to take us alive, nor can we defeat them in the battle. Eleazar managed to persuade the rebels that better to die than falling into hands of Romans. And each went to his family passing the sword through the body of their family's members and then killing each other. Ten men are left probably, the leaders. They made lots and nine kill each other while the last commit suicide. Bill Clinton, George W. Bush visited the mountain as part of their official visit to Israel as presidents of the United States of America. And even when Trump came on his 24 hours visit, 
He had to choose one site between Holocaust Museum, Wailing Wall, or Metzada. And Israel was pushing for Metzada. Only reason for Trump not to visit Metzada was that helicopter won't land on Metzada. And Trump would have had to take the cable car, which he did not agree. Why Metzada? Many Israeli battalions did their induction ceremony on Metzada. But as late of 1980s, they don't anymore. Why? Metzada is a story. Between 1948 till after the Six-Day War, Israel victorious triumph, Israel was pictured, and truthfully, people also felt as underdog country, surrounded by enemies from all around. Just like Metzada was sieged by the Romans, and as a result, became a symbol. Metzada will not fall again. Israel will not fall again. But the debate amid the old school of archaeology and the new post-Zionist archaeology over the story of Metzada is what changed the image of the fortress and the place. The heated debate does not deny the story that took place here, but the ending of this dramatic story. Was Metzada a heroic act, or was it a mass murder by the Sikhari fanatic group against those Jewish fellows taking refuge at the fortress top? At the moment, the moments breached the wall. If we were in their place, would we take our own lives or fight and die in honor? Is Josephus' account accurate, which archaeology has a hard time to prove? For sure, there was a siege and defenders. But the story, we're not here to give answers, but to tell the story of the present reflected by the past. Well, we invite you to come and visit the mountains. Then perhaps you might get an answer to what happened over here. There's the mountain. There's the ramp. Here are the camps all testify for that dramatic story. Where we are standing is actually where we have burial place of the remains of zealots, or what's believed to be zealots or Sikharite, brought over here and buried by the State of Israel, by Yigal Yadin. Are these the remains of the soldiers or the rebels who fought against the Romans? Well, another debate. Matsada is a symbol. Matsada is a story. Come visit the mountain. Explore the top of it. And get to your own conclusions regarding what happened over here. But for sure, this is one of the most famous fortresses of the world.